Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee from the Skill Builder channel and I found something else to get angry about, sewage. You may have seen the stories on the television or in the newspapers about raw sewage being discharged into our rivers, our streams and even into our sea. Shock horror, raw sewage rather than the nice cooked stuff which you'll find out later is a lot better. So as this channel is about all things building that does include drains and sewers so I'm not straying too far off topic and let me lay my credentials on the line. When I did my city and guilds I actually gained a distinction in drainage. Now a lot of people wouldn't boast about that but I've got to take victories as they come. Now to be honest I've always been an enthusiast when it comes to drains. It's earned me a lot of money over the years and given me hours of fun. I think we should be proud of our sewers and drains. I mean a lot of countries don't have anywhere near as sophisticated a system as we do and people die as a consequence. In fact the introduction of a sewage system was one of the greatest leaps forward in terms of public health that we've ever made. I mean compared with other things like penicillin it's really up there. Those visionary Victorian engineers such as Joseph Bazalgette who designed and oversaw the building of our London sewers is hardly remembered by any school child today. They may learn about Einstein, Newton and all the rest of it but Joseph Bazalgette who's he? And of course if Joseph Bazalgette doesn't get the accolades he deserves there is absolutely no chance for all those thousands of unsung heroes, mostly Irishmen, on the end of shovels digging our London sewers and laying the bricks which form the basis of a sewage system which is still in operation today. Now before I get bogged down in that cesspit which is Westminster politics I just want to explain a few things about our sewers and our drains which you might not know and explain also why we might even sometimes be our own worst enemy. So let's get into the nasty stuff straight away. This is our lovely flushing WC. We flush the WC if you're lucky, if you're not my kids and then it goes into the manhole. Now that used to be great, it used to be two gallons of water and everything was hunky-dory but then they decided we needed to save water and what better place to save water than when you flush the loo. So they reduced the flush to six litres and even four and a half litres when you're just having a pee. Now we have less water going into our drainage system. Now there's nothing wrong with that, it's all been tested and it's deemed to be suitable to just have six litres of water to flush your poo away. But sometimes there are problems in the drain. I mean I don't have to go into this in too much detail but we do get things like wet wipes, cotton buds, condoms, sanitary items, all kinds of things flush down that loo which probably shouldn't be. Now there is a golden rule they say only flush things down the loo that begin with a P that is poo, P obviously and uh, what paella? No paper. <laughs> now let's be honest some people use their WC as a waste disposal unit. I mean if you live on the top floor of a flat and last night's curry is stinking your flat out you're not going to walk all the way down to the bins to safely dispose of it. A lot of people are going to put their vindaloo down the loo. Comedy gold this. And of course it's not only things going down the loo, we've got our sink, we've got our washing machine, we've got our showers, we've got our bath and any number of different things now which are connected up to the main sewer. Now when the sewers were first designed none of this happened. Sir Joseph Bazalgette never had to think about all these things like dishwashers, washing machines, baths, showers in every house. All he was concerned with is a very minimal amount of water that was going down and it coped well but they are now seriously overloaded. So let's continue our journey from our loo to the sewage station to find out why a lot of this stuff is finishing up in our streams and our rivers. The sewage continues by ever larger pipes until it gets to the sewage station where it hits a screen. Now that screen should filter out all the things that I've just described, the condoms, the tampons and the wet wipes. All of those should be caught by the screen and disposed of somewhere. There is no second hand market in used condoms. They've got to dis be disposed of probably in the landfill. Happy days for the time team of the future. Now once we got rid of all those nasties, what's left goes into what we call 
a sludge catchment tank, a settlement tank, or a sludge lagoon. And what happens there is that all the sludge, all the solids, all the nasty poo and everything else sinks to the bottom and the water spills over the top of the sludge lagoon into the next stage. By the way, never go swimming in a sludge lagoon. So the sludge sinks to the bottom, the sludge is actually removed, it's pumped out with giant pumps and it's actually warmed up and then it's used to create methane which is used to produce electricity which is used to power the sewage works. Now that might sound like a wonderful modern thing but that's been going on for over 50 years. Recycling wasn't invented in 2002. And once they've got the methane out of the sludge, they actually dry it out again with this recycled electricity and they turn it into something which is called cake. Now, this is not exceedingly good cake. So what happens to that cake? Well, the cake is burned again to produce even more electricity. And then once that cake has finished being burned, the burn cake is sent out to farmers who spread it on their field to grow our food. So you can have your cake and eat it or Oh, never mind. So what happens to all this water here? Well, it's put into another container and it's blown full of air, make lots of lovely bubbles. And those bubbles stimulate the good bacteria, which starts eating the bad bacteria. This is a triumph of good over evil. If it were the other way around, we'd be stuffed. We probably wouldn't even be here. The bacteria does its work. And as it does its work, it consumes, it actually gobbles up all that bad bacteria and grows fat and happy and lazy and then goes and lies on the bottom and turns into sludge. So that sludge is returned back into the system to stimulate new bacteria and continue the battle. There is no rest for good bacteria. Now the water is then taken through uh, some big filter beds. You may have seen those where they have arms spread round and they're just spraying the water down through sand. And basically it goes through the sand to remove any other little tiny bits that haven't been removed by the screen. And then after another bit of treatment, it is sent out into our rivers and streams. Not as drinkable water, but water that has gone through this process to remove the bad bacteria and all the things which might kill us. So there's no problem there until it rains. And then we come back here. And we see that not only have we got our shower waste going in here and our bath and our sink and all the rest of it, we've also got the rainwater off our roof. So that's going into the gully. And obviously when you get the heavy rain, it's all going into the sewers and overwhelming the sewers. And short of that water backing up through our sewers and our drains and up through our loo, and I've seen that many times, which is why I now live on the top of a hill. We have to do something with it. And the water companies decide that the only thing they can do with it, they've got to chuck it out into the rivers and streams. So that's happening more and more. And why is it happening more and more? Well, it's happening more and more because we've got more people. We have a million more people coming into this country every year and we're not really catering for that. So what the authorities are trying to do is they're trying to say to people, stop putting your rainwater into the foul water and put it into a surface water drain. Now a surface water drain could be a completely separate drain system that runs alongside the sewers and takes that water straight through into land drainage and streams and rivers or even directly into the sea. But as it's rainwater, there's no harm. But of course, when Joseph Bazalgette built the London sewers, he wasn't thinking of that kind of capacity. What he did is he said, well, you can put the rainwater into the sewers. It'll help flush them out and it'll make a great job. But of course, if we get a heavy rainfall in London, they have no choice at the moment but to chuck it straight into the River Thames. Now, that is all going to change because they're building the Thames Tideway, which is the London super sewer, 
which when it's finished will take a huge capacity. We're not going to dig up all those streets in London and start laying dual systems with surface water and foul water side by side and running all the rainwater off the buildings into there. So we have to just cope with what we got and the answer was to build this whacking great super sewer. So I hope that helps explain a little bit about our drains but you know a lot of people treat our drainage system as if it's something you can just dispose of anything you like. I mean there was a guy doing oven cleaning over the road and he was making a great job of using all this acid to clean this oven up and when he had finished cleaning the oven I saw him take the big container and pour it straight down the gully in the road and of course that gully in the road is not going to the sewage station it's going directly into our rivers and streams. So you get this kind of thing all the time. You also get people in newer houses on dual systems where they've got the rainwater and the sewage separated and they decide for convenience that they're going to chuck the bath water or the dishwasher or something else straight into the surface water just because that happens to be the nearest gully. Some of them don't even know that it's a problem and I point it out to them and a lot of the time they just shrug their shoulders and say well it is what it is. What's a little bit of bath water or dishwasher water going to do to our rivers and streams? Well it's not going to do an awful lot on an individual basis but when you have that repeated thousands and thousands of times then it does become a problem. So it's probably only people like me who take an interest in drains who are going to notice these sort of things and you know I've developed a bit of a nose for it because the other day I was walking up the street it's a lovely sunny day it hadn't rained for a few days and there was water running down the road and I thought where's that coming from burst water main or whatever and as I walked up the road I could see that in somebody's front garden was a manhole it was overflowing there were tissues there there were all kinds of loo roll there and it was just a horrible horrible mess and that was all spilling out of their front garden into the road and going down the road and entering into the rainwater system through a gully. So I could have gone and knocked on their door and told them about the problem but I figured they probably knew about it. I mean they must have been stepping through this muck for days on end judging by the state of it. And you know what I've been in houses where people are completely oblivious to that kind of thing. I mean they even let their kids play in it. They think it's some kind of free paddling pool. I decided not to knock on their door but I decided to grasp them up to Thames Water. You have to report these things on their website and you start filling in the form and it says where's it coming from? Is it entering the rainwater system i.e. through a gully in the road? Yes. And then the next question is quite surprising. It says is it harming animals? It doesn't say anything about is it harming human beings presumably because they think human beings aren't stupid enough to go and lick the water that's running down the road but maybe they think dogs, cats, foxes and all the other things will. So once you say yes they send you a thing that says we'll be out in this particular case they said we'll be out at 6.33. Now if anybody tells you you're going to be out at 6.33 you know they're not a human being. You know it's a bot, it's AI. Actually it was 11 o'clock at night when they turned up to clear the blockage and the guy had been run off his feet, very very busy, nice guy and he said usual story, load of wet wipes, loads of blooming nappy liners and all the rest of it. What chance have you got with these people? So I'm not letting the water companies off the hook here because they are to blame. Ultimately they are to blame for the situation but we've all got to do our bit to stop abusing and misusing our drainage system because I love to swim in the open water but sadly in the UK there are only two or three rivers which are designated as being safe to swim in. Now in France they have 500 designated safe rivers. So go figure, what are we doing wrong? Now I've got a few friends who work in the water industry and I've got to say that a lot of them when I have a chat to them are a bit disillusioned. A bit disillusioned is probably an understatement. Now the case of Sarah Bentley who was the former CEO of Thames Water is well documented. She had a 1.6 million pound bonus but of course she looked at this in the light of all the news stories about sewage being discharged into our streams, our rivers and our seas and she decided that maybe it wasn't a good time to be taking this bonus so she decided to decline it. Allegedly she took it in other ways behind the scenes that wouldn't have such a high profile and then after that she resigned. 
Now, to tell you the truth, it's a bit of a mystery why she did resign, but in her very brief parting statement, she did say that it had been a privilege to work alongside the dedicated colleagues at Thames Water. Now, presumably, she wasn't talking about working alongside those guys who walked down and wade through the London sewers with giant grappling hooks to tackle fatbergs the size of double-decker buses. She probably hasn't even met them. And certainly they won't be getting a £1.6 million bonus. Now that's some trick, isn't it? Because not only are companies like Thames Water managed to alienate the general public and their customers, they've also managed to alienate their staff. The bank of goodwill is empty for those companies. And when you're in that situation, there's only one way you can go and that's downhill. Now, when I say that the Bank of Goodwill is empty, that's not the only bank that's empty because apparently Thames Water is on the verge of bankruptcy and the chances are it's going to be taken back into public ownership. The Australian investment company that had shares in Thames Water stripped large amount of money out of there in full view of the watchdog and they have disappeared off into the sunset, leaving the company with these huge debts. It may surprise you to know that Australian investment companies haven't always got our best interests at heart. But you know the underinvestment has been going on for a long time. It's widely believed that the water companies would rather pay the fines for discharging this sewage into our rivers and streams than invest the billions of pounds to improve the infrastructure, because it's cheaper. Now, there is a, a regulator, a watchdog, if you like, in place, which is supposed to oversee this and make sure that the public gets good value and our interests are safeguarded. And when you look on Offwatt's website, and I do recommend it, it's full of lovely statements and woolly language all about how they've got the best interest of the customer at heart and also how the environment is a priority for them and all the time they've been overseeing this fiasco. And of course, we have to look at who set off what up and how this situation arose. And of course, that was the privatization of the water companies under Margaret Thatcher. But before she privatized them, she cut the investment down because she wanted to cut down borrowing and public spending in order to get rid of inflation. All laudable things, but when you think about it, when she stopped the water companies and all the other public utilities from borrowing money, it meant that they had to pay for any investment out of their current receipts. And if you're looking at something like the Thames Super Sewer, there is no way that you're going to pay for that kind of investment without borrowing some money. So she had a shopkeeper's mentality, if you like, but really when you start applying that to the bigger picture, it just doesn't work. But of course, she got rid of the problem by selling the whole lot off, along with the railways, the gas and everything else. She just thought they would be better off in private hands because they would be more efficient and there would be greater competition. Think about that, greater competition in water. That means you've got two pipes coming to your house, two taps, and you decide which one's going to be cheaper to run today. It is absolute nonsense. And it's come full circle, Mrs. Thatcher, if you're still listening, because it now seems that Thames Water is going to be taken back into public ownership, along with failing railway companies and everything else. It's now going to be the taxpayer who picks up the tab and pays for all that much needed investment through, you've guessed it, higher water charges. So the motto for the future is use less, pay more. Honestly, I could weep except I don't want to flood the place.